Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us again. This session, we're going to be talking about some of the most important thing that ever happened on this earth. The events around the crucifixion of Jesus. If you ask most people, most Christians, why did Jesus have to die? Most will give an answer that says something like, well, he had to pay the price for my sin. And they're very thankful for that. Ken, are there other reasons that could be given why Jesus had to die? Well, <clears throat> yes, there are. Theologians have been thinking about this and talking about it and arguing about it, I might add, for almost from the day it happened. There have been lots of theories. One of the interesting ones, just to sort of get you thinking before we actually go back to the events of Christ that famous weekend, was called the Ransom Theory. And the Ransom Theory was based on the idea that in those days, around 200, 300 years after Christ was here on this earth, there were wealthy families who had children that they wanted to send to school or they wanted them to send outside, outside the home for various activities. And they would employ people to guard those children because it, when there were so many slaves and people couldn't pay. And in those days, many of the people who were, quote, slaves were actually just in debt. If they could pay their debt, then they would be freed from their slavery. And it became quite a, a thing to, to kidnap one of these children of a wealthy family and demand a certain amount of money, and then you use that money to pay for your freedom. So the idea came that what happened is that we as a human family had sold ourselves into the hands of Satan. And Satan claimed us, we were all his. He said, all human beings belong to me. So God comes to the devil and he negotiates with him. He says, okay, so I know you've always wanted to be in the place of Jesus or you wanted to be like Jesus, so I'll make you a deal. I will give you Jesus in exchange for all human beings. And the devil says, well, that sounds like a good deal. Uh, Jesus is worth more than all those people anyway. So he agreed to the deal. So he, God takes all of us back and he gives the devil Jesus. And of course, that was the story of Jesus' life and death here on this earth. But the devil, unfortunately, discovers on resurrection morning that he can't hang on to Jesus. So Jesus escapes. So in effect, we would say that Jesus, I mean God, won the great controversy by tricking the devil. Now, I hope you're not real happy with that approach. <laughs> but that was the idea in, in early days. And of course, there are, there are verses in the scripture that talk about ransom and redemption and so forth that, that seem that you could interpret to be something like that. But there, there, there have to be better answers than that. And we'll, of course, try to talk about some of those. But if you generalize that just a little bit, you could say that a ransom is when you provide something of value mm -hmm to alter an outcome. Yeah. And in, in that context, Jesus did die, mm -hmm. provided something of value to alter an outcome. Mm -hmm. the, what is not stated in that is the mechanism by which that outcome is changed. And there are a lot of people who, especially Old Testament theologians, make a great deal out of the, out of the kinsman redeemer idea in which in the Old Testament system, a relative could come and pay your debt for you and, and, and get you out of, out of that. And, but of course, at the end of seven years, okay. no matter, even if you couldn't pay, assuming, assuming they were following the correct pattern, you would be automatically released from, from your slavery. Well, so something of value, would that be Jesus' death or would that be his resurrection? That would be the whole Jesus event, his life, his death, mm -hmm. his resurrection 
the whole package. And where, so that, where, go ahead. where does that, when they think that way, where do they get the standard from that that God has to yeah. has to bind himself to negotiate with the, the devil to to get his outcome? Well, that's a that's a I mean, people understood the idea of, of paying a ransom to get your kid back. That was a common understanding. People understood that when people talked about you pay a ransom to, to redeem your captive, your, your kidnapped child. So it, it sort of was natural. They said, well, oh, well, we're God's children, so he's paid a ransom to get, a, get his kids back. It's kind of similar, those, like some of those old movies, those stories where you've got this poor family that the banker is going to come in and oh, yeah. and and um, foreclose on them, the house, and then yeah. somebody comes in with a bunch of money, pays the banker off, and the banker goes, "Oh, I guess it's paid off. I guess you get you keep your house." Yeah. But the in that scenario, then who's the banker? In, well, in with y y with God. Here's here's the problem, and and let's just make it very clear up front. The the people who use that scenario, the whole thing. Have, have made a, a, a serious uh, legal confusion. Let me explain what the legal confusion is. If you, let's say, uh, have a car, uh, you have an auto accident. It's, it's completely an accident, but you bump into somebody or whatever and you, you ruin their car. Your auto insurance company will pay, assuming it's doing its job, it will pay for the repair of your car and the repair of that other person's car. Because that's not a criminal activity, it's a, it's a civil suit, okay? It's not a criminal activity. So now we ask the question, Jesus said that sin leads to death. That sounds like a criminal activity. You die for what you did. That sounds like a criminal activity. But we would, I mean, suppose that now someone would show up in U.S. courts, for example, and says, well, here's a person that has just committed, killed five people, and someone says, oh, no problem, I'll pay the ransom for him, and he can go free. We would say, what? No. 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 no way. We're not going to allow that. The person himself has to pay for his own crimes. And not with money. And not with money. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, he, you have to deal with your own, your own crime. You can't pay, you know, no matter how much money you can, you, you pay, you, you can't get out of it. So the idea that Jesus could somehow pay a debt and get us out does one of two things. Either it suggests that sin really isn't that serious. God said it's deadly. But they're saying it's not really that serious. Or secondly, they're confusing whether it's a civil or a criminal offense, whether sin is a civil or a criminal offense. And God said it's the most serious thing that human beings have ever done. I would call that criminal. It's not a punishment, it's just a natural consequence. Sin, and I think most of us here at this table are of the, of the similar agreement, sin is just something you do that separates you from God, which is the life source. That's, yeah. that's what sin is. Yeah. And it pays its wage. God, God isn't in the business of punishing. Sin pays its wage, and the wage is death. Okay, so let's go ahead. What, what about... I mean, we've really launched into the heart of this discussion yeah. right, right off. What about the term sacrifice? Okay, that, well, I mean, that's all the way from old till yeah. new till, you let's, know, and that... Let's go back and let's, let's look at historically now. Well, we've jumped into the middle of the argument, so we, we <laughs> hope you're thinking out there. Think about what we've said so far. We're going to jump into the history itself and see what we can learn from the historical context. So we start out with a passage. Uh, it's covered by all three of the synoptic gospels. That would be Matthew, Mark, and Luke. <coughs> We're going to start with Matthew 26 and verse 17. And we're going to find there that Jesus gives his, some, some instructions to his disciples. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, that would be the Passover, the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, where do you want us to get the Passover meal ready for you? Go to a certain man in the city, he said to them, and tell him, the teacher says, my, house is, my hour has come. My disciples and I will celebrate the Passover at your house. Now, several things of interest there. Jesus has repeatedly said in his life so far, no, I can't, you know, you can't do this to me now, whatever, because my time, is not my time has not yet come. And now he's saying what? It's here. It's here, okay? So Jesus knew that his time had come. 
Um, so the, the, the t disciples did as Jesus had told them and prepared the, prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, Jesus and the twelve disciples sat down to eat, and then if you go, and we don't have time to look at all of this, but if you compare uh, Mark uh, chapter 14, uh, 12 through 16, and Luke 22, 7 to 13, you'll find out that it was apparently John and, and Peter that were sent, and they found this man carrying a water jug, and they went back to his house, and all that. A little more of the details, which we're not going to take up right now. So then they went and prepared to have their Passover meal. Now, there's something that Christians often overlook in this, several things that Christians often overlook when they look at this story. First of all, what, what, what's the normal food at a Passover meal? A lamb, lamb and unleavened bread. Roasted lamb and bitter herbs. Bitter herbs. And unleavened bread. Okay. Did Jesus and the disciples eat roasted lamb? Well, Is there any hint of it anywhere in the Bible? You know, if they were celebrating the Passover in the manner that was the matter of their custom, that's what you would assume that that's what they were doing. And what about the bitter herbs? In my French, one of my French Bible, it said that Jesus said to the one I give this meat. Yeah. But he didn't say lamb, or didn't specify, well, but he said meat. Meat there just means food. So okay. you have to decide. So, Oh, so in French, I thought it was really viande. <laughs> no, no. Does it say what they're eating? Because mine well, says bread. But we celebrate the Passover all the time, don't we? What we call the Lord's Supper. And what do we eat? Bread, bread and grape wine. juice. Bread and grape juice. Well, but that's... But that's, those, that's, that was, those are symbols. That's the new that's one. Not, what may, not necessarily what they ate. Well, but yeah, it does talk about the well, bread. And, yeah, and, he, he, yes, this but is my body. This is my blood. It talks about that. So there's a, a disconnect, or it seems to be a disconnect between the Old Testament Passover service that they were supposed to be celebrating and what Jesus and the disciples actually did. Maybe Jesus just picked up a couple items from the dinner and he did not use the lamb in and, any way. And that's possible. Now, at the Passover dinner, then they were served wine also at a normal Passover dinner? I mean, grape juice? Well, w I mean, we don't, I mean, I don't know. I can't answer that whether that was the custom in Jesus' day or not. I, I don't know. Um, I, I, it would be a little difficult because the time for grape harvest, of course, would be in the fall, and this is in the spring. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't, have, they wouldn't have any way of have, having fresh grape juice. It would have to be reconstituted, reconstituted raisin juice or something like that, which they sometimes did. So this was in the spring. This was in the spring. And We're talking early April. You can almost, it seems like if they ate something out of the ordinary that the author might. Would have mentioned Mentioned it. it. Yeah. I mean, if it's something that's out of the ordinary from what they usually do over yeah. Passover, they would, he would have mentioned it. So, but he was instituting a new, and that's a new the, ritual. <laughs> I give you something new now. Right. So does this mean now he's given up the roasted lamb and the bitter herbs? And he's left with the unleavened bread and the grape juice? I guess we get to guess. We can guess, yeah. And the other thing is that if they hadn't have walked in there worrying about who's going to be first in the kingdom, w w would the whole scenario change right then? Well, and, and what about that? Do we have, what evidence do we have of what they were talking about on their way into the upper room, because that's where, where it took place. Do you remember? So they were realizing a big meeting was about to have happened. Well, of course, what, what was their idea about what was going to happen? Um, Jesus was going to um, be declared king or somehow make a yeah. move in order to be king. Yeah. Look at Luke 22. If you, it, and I, well, I won't take time to read the whole thing, but they're, they're experiencing the Lord's Supper, starting with verse 14 down to 23, and then verse 24, right in the middle of his discussion, now this is Luke, he wasn't there, but Luke is very careful, or quite careful about keeping things chronological, right in the middle of that discussion in verse 24, an argument broke out among the disciples as to which one of them should be thought of as the greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the pagans have power over their people, and the rulers claim their friends, 
claim the title friends of the people, but this is not the way it is with you. Rather, the greatest among you must be like the youngest and the leader, must be like the servant, who is greater and then a source. Um, he goes on to talk about other things which we normally connect with the events in the upper room. So they, they were politically posturing themselves for a new leader, and they wanted to get themselves into position to serve in his uh, government. Do we know who was sitting next to Jesus? Mm -hmm. Who? Judas and John. Yes. Judas and John. Yeah, exactly. Well, and s without going into details, we know that what happened before they started, what was, what was supposed to happen before they started their meal? They were foot washing. Foot washing. Yeah, they would normally, n normally there would be a servant there, there would be a bucket of water and a towel, and it was expected that people had come in off the streets and they wore sandals and they were dusty, and maybe muddy at that time of year. And I just kind of wondered why there wasn't a servant there. Maybe Jesus said, you don't need to come. Well, or God arranged it without having to say anything. Now, is the foot washing usually done before every meal, or was it done specifically on a Passover meal? It was meal? done whenever you came to someone's house. If you were invited to someone's house, it was expected that when you got there, so, the servant would wash your feet, so that when you went inside, you would have clean feet. This was a, this was a local custom of the day. It had nothing to do with the traditional Passover. No, it had nothing to do with the traditional Passover. The rules and and guidelines were given for how to celebrate the Passover. That was that yeah. Had nothing was no. What about poor people that didn't have servants? You would do it yourself if you were if you're rich enough to invite somebody over to your house. Now we just take off our shoes. But that's was it wasn't there some custom though that you can sort of halfway understand why the disciples were talking apart from their ignorance? If you went to you didn't sit at the table, you reclined. Yeah. And you usually the one that was considered the for want of a better term, the chief visitor went closest to the host and then mm. went down like yeah. that. So there was some indication of why the disciples yeah. would think like this. So, and you're suggesting something that, you know, we look at the, the Last Supper by da Vinci and we think, oh, well, and that's, there they are sitting bolt upright in, oh. in, in high back chairs. The custom in Jesus' day was there would be a low table, often it would be circular or, yeah. or maybe oval or something like this. And you would sit down a little bit like this, resting on it, and your feet would be out like that. So you would be, you know, someone else would be here next to you and so forth like this, and you're eating with your, your right hand like this. So they were all lying around the table with their feet stretched out like spokes away from the, from the center part of the table. That's, that's the way this happened. Is that a healthy way to eat? That's how they did it. That's the way they did it. That's the way they did it. Try that someday, see if I can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chairs were expensive back then. <laughs> there, there's some, some interesting comments in Desire of Ages 643. Um, he longed to, um, the, on this last evening with his disciples, Jesus had much to tell them. If they had been prepared to receive what he longed to impart, they would have been saved from the heartbreaking anguish from disappointment and unbelief. But Jesus saw that they could not bear what he had to say. As he looked into their faces, the words of warning and comfort were stayed upon his lips. Moments passed in silence. Jesus appeared to be waiting. The disciples were ill at ease. Mm -hmm. They all knew what they should have done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but... What was it that they, he, why couldn't he say? What was it that, yeah. I, I'm not well, sure I understand what it was that, that blocked the words. Here's, here's, here's a clue uh, found over in John 16, I believe it's verse 7, if I'm not mistaken here. Let's look at this. Uh, no, it's verse 12. I have much more to tell you, but now it would be too much for you to bear. Mm. So what do you think would have happened if he'd have said it? They'd have melted into sugar lumps, or well, <laughs> well, they were they were waiting for some great thing to happen. Isn't it just as simple as finding out that it isn't going to happen? That he's going to be crucified. Would they have got up and walked out? Well, what would you have done if you were in their condition? In I their have position? no idea what I would have done. <laughs> well, you probably would have been so distracted you wouldn't have been able to to pick up the messages he was wanting to 
Yeah. Yeah. Do they still well, have? And, and Jesus has told them already four times mm -hmm. what's going to happen to him, and they, they didn't get it. That's Luke 18. Yeah. Well, we know the traditional story. It's found in Luke 21, starting with verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table with the apostles. He said to them, I have wanted so much to eat this Passover me with you before I supper. Now, if it stopped right there, we would just assume that it was what? A regular Passover meal. Bitter herbs, yeah. roasted lamb, and unleavened bread, right? Mm -hmm. For I tell you, I will not, never eat it until it is given its full meaning in the kingdom of God. Now, are we going to be eating roasted lamb in the kingdom of God? Well, what does he mean when it is given its full meaning? Yeah. Then Jesus took a cup, gave thanks to God, and said, Take this and share it among yourselves. I tell you that from now on I will not drink this wine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a piece of bread, gave thanks to God, and broke it, gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, he gave them the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is God's new covenant, sealed with my blood, which is poured out for you, and so forth. Did they question when he said, my blood which is poured out for you? It hadn't been you don't, poured we out We don't yet. know what was going on in their mm -hmm. brains. This is page 6, 52 says, He ate the Passover with his <coughs> disciples. As he ate the Passover with his disciples, he instituted in its place mm -hmm. the service that was to be the memorial of his yeah. great sacrifice. So it looks like there was two things going on there. It was eating the regular... The transition. The, the regular and a new transition. Yeah. And let me, I have wondered um, about this. Um, what, 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 is, what is happening here is Christ is instituting with this supper a memorial of, um, we'll use the term sacrifice here. Mm -hmm. um, and it's replacing the Passover, which was a similar thing, a memorial of the sacrifice to come, which... Um, uh, uh, you know, the moment that that problem occurred in, in Eden, there was a message to the people, to, to Adam and Eve. There was, a, there, was a, there was a sacrifice of this lamb. Is, 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 is this communion service that we, sell to, to, that we celebrate today, is it, is it just a continuing, it's just a new form of reminder that God, a ritual that God has had since the very beginning of sin, is it just that this, this, this ritual changes? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, maybe not, depending upon generations, but is that really what it is? It's just a... To a considerable extent, yes, because in the, at the garden, just outside the Garden of Eden, they sacrifice the lamb. God says, this is what I want you to do to remind you how serious sin is. Sin leads to death. We come down to the Exodus, and, and we're celebrating the fact that they're, they're getting their freedom from slavery. We come to the crucifixion and supposedly, and we were, I hope we would all agree, that this is supposed to be a celebration of our, uh, of our um, freedom from sin. That's what that's supposed to be. And well, then in heaven it may transform again. Well, at the end, at the end of this world's history, when he comes a second time, it's going to be a celebration of our freedom from from sin again. So it's really nothing, nothing new in a sense. It's, it's just a new, a new form. I think though that it is a focal point. All of the ones before were pointing forward to, to this one. Mm -hmm. And what we do now points back to that. Mm -hmm. And all of eternity will be looking to see that that one focal point in history. So depends on which side of the fence those you're looking are, at it. Those are all teachable moments. Mm -hmm. And when we did their uh, sacrifice with a lamb with, uh, with Adam, that's the first demonstration of what death really was. Yeah. No finite being in the universe had ever seen or observed what death was. And he takes a, Adam, God had Adam take that lamb. We, we get, I think about page 50 of uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, she, she deals with that. So. All of those points you, you cited are teachable moments. Yeah. And God is in the teaching business as a parent. That's, that's his job, is to teach his kids. Well, unfortunately, there were 13 of them there. And one wasn't real happy about what was going on. And Judas, sitting next to Jesus, had already decided that he would do what? 
betray him. And why was he going to betray Jesus? I mean, Jesus was the leader of the group. He was obviously he had power. He was miraculous. He had all kinds of stuff he could do. What, 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 what was the problem? He wasn't handling this very well. Yeah. <laughs> he thought he could pressure Jesus into doing something. Okay. Judas thought one of two things. He said, either, either Jesus is a fraud, and I'm going to get out of this, or else he, he, he's, he's a good man, which he believed. I think Judas really believed that. But he thought, Jesus just doesn't have the gumption to stand up and, and, and declare himself king. So I'm going to force him to, to, to take action by, by forcing him to stand trial before the Sanhedrin. And when he becomes king, I will get credit for putting him on the throne. Well, this was really with the best of intentions. Well, Not yeah, <laughs> sort of. And his for own him, <laughs> selfish and, intentions. And make a little money on selfish. the side. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> make so. a little money, yeah. Well, that's sometimes how we try to control God. We want to control the situation rather yeah. than having God control. He, he had figured out a way to guarantee being prime minister. <laughs> yeah. Is this kind of like Treasure. the Pharisees and Sadducees that would come to Jesus with these questions that they knew the answer yeah. had to be this or that mm -hmm. and whichever way it is we got gotcha. you right and Judas was getting out of this one way or the other mm -hmm. and there was no other possibility in his mind in his mind he hadn't thought of any other possibility and Jesus slipped through them both every time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he yeah. should have remembered that <laughs> <laughs> yeah well Jesus said and I'm reading from Luke 22 again starting with verse 21 but look the one who betrays me is here at the table with me. The Son of Man will die as God has decided, but how terrible for that man who betrays him. Then they begin to ask among themselves which of them it could be who is going to do this. And of course, that's the point at which Luke mentions the fact that they were arguing among themselves about who is going to be the greatest. So, um, incredible, absolutely incredible experience. And Jesus did what? He took a piece of bread and dipped it in the sauce. Now, this, is that the wine or is that at the part of the bitter herbs or what is the sauce? No, I would say it's the bitter herbs. Probably. Some, something made with the bitter herbs. would call that a sauce. And he Almost. hands it to Lu Judas and all of a sudden Judas says, I'm sure Judas panicked temporarily. He thought he's going to expose me. And the other disciples are going to be very upset because they're going to think, hey, this Judas has pu pulled off a coup. Right? But Jesus didn't. Explain. She says he, he didn't hear. He didn't hear what Jesus had said. Well, why do you think he didn't <laughs> hear? His mind was racing 90 miles an hour. Yeah. But there was a lot of is it I? Is it I? Is it I going on? And there was some 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 confusion and mm -hmm. in that why he missed it. Yeah. Well, then we know that what happened next. Jesus said, "What you do, do quickly." And what does that mean? Go out and take care of the poor. If that's Believe what it or care, not, Judas was the carrier of the purse. He carried the money for the whole group. And the disciples somehow thought that, hey, Judas is going to go out and he must, he must be going to give some money to the poor or something else like that because they couldn't imagine any one of their group actually betraying Jesus. But there's more to the story than that and we're running out of time for the first half of our program. So I'm going to ask you to stay by. We'll pick up the rest of the story when we come right back. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. Judas had everything figured out. He figured that whatever happened, he was going to win. And Jesus knew from way back. Judas started scheming from like day one. He, he really went at the point where Jesus really started turning against Jesus was the time at the feeding of the 5,000 when Judas was absolutely determined. Here, was this, here were the huge crowds, and they were so excited about what Jesus has done. He's just fed the whole lot of them, probably 20,000 people. He's done all kinds of miracles. Jesus, Judas said, man, this is the perfect moment. Let's grab him and crown him. And Jesus forbade it. He said, you can't do this. He forced his disciples to, to get down to the, to the edge of the lake, get in the boat, and depart. And from that time on, Judas says, this guy just doesn't know what's best for him. I, have a, I, I know better than God does. That's, well, he wouldn't have said it like that. But that's, that's what it was. That's what he was trying to say. I know, I, have a better, I, I know better what's good for God than God knows for himself. And unfortunately, we know what the results were for, for Judas. Why didn't Jesus just level with the disciples and say what this guy is all about? Because if he had done that in some way earlier, then people would say, well, Judas had a, had a reason for doing what he did. Look, what, look at how Jesus treated him. On the other hand, if Jesus didn't say anything about Judas's behavior, people would say, well, if he knows the future, if he can predict the future, if he's God even, how come he didn't know? So Jesus, by just dropping two, one or two or three very subtle hints made it clear that yes, he did know, but it wasn't enough of a hint so anyone could figure out what exactly Jesus. Was. So Judas walks that. I mean, Jesus walks that that line he always does, just very carefully walks between these two, uh, you know, abysses, and he he he. he when it was all, without pushing it, yeah. uh, pushing the envelope either way, just yeah. he, he maintained who he was, yeah. and ultimately let let the the exposure come, and they could look back and say, "Yeah, Jesus did see it coming." But uh, that's why yeah. I would read it. You know, you look through Jesus's life; he he wasn't really a man who made a lot of claims. No, it's like he he kind of showed he, them things. He made some outlandish Even, claims, but. Well, I like, mean, I am God. <laughs> yeah, well, Many times. if you look, if you look at how he does things, yeah. I mean, even yeah, like, with Judas, he could have said, "He's the guy yeah. right there," but he didn't do that. He, you know, he did it this way, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. made it something that we have to kind of figure out. Yeah. Afterwards, so, yeah. I had out. an interesting experience in a sort of a New Age town where I live, uh, near me. Uh, T-shirt that says "Atheist for Jesus," oh, brother. <laughs> and I had to ask the man. It was in the grocery store, young man, uh, what that meant, and he says, "I like the man and his values, but this God thing I don't agree with." Wow! Isn't that amazing? <laughs> really? Hey, there's an interesting paragraph in this thing. Mm -hmm. There's the dis the disciples searched one another's faces closely as they asked, Lord, is it I? Now the silence of Judas drew all eyes to him. Amid the confusion of questions and expressions of astonishment, Judas had not heard the words of Jesus in answer to John's question. But now, to escape the scrutiny of the disciples, he asked as they had done, Master, is it I? Jesus solemnly replied, Thou hast said. Uh -huh. uh. Interestingly, on that same verse in the New International Version, Matthew 26, 25, it says, Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. Mm -hmm. but there's a footnote that says, You yourself have said it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one is exposing Judas, the other is not. Mm -hmm. Which was it? Yeah. It's just like, are you the son of God? You said Pilate so. Said, <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> same thing. Yeah, yeah same, same thing. thing. Yeah, exactly. Well, moving on, we've talked about the washing of the feet, the having a meal. That's, the washing of the feet is mainly covered in John chapter 13. 
Then we come to John chapter 14. Uh, well, actually at the end of John 13, starting with verse 36, we, we notice something that's a fairly familiar thing. You've heard probably lots of sermons about this. Where you, Jesus has said, and now I give you a new commandment, love one another as I have loved you, so that you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. And he, before that, he said, my children, I shall not be with you very much longer. You will look for me, but I tell you now what I told the Jewish authorities. You cannot go where I am going. And then Peter's response, where are you going, Lord? Simon Peter asked him. You cannot follow me now where I am going, answered Jesus, but later you will follow me. Lord, why can't I follow you now, asked Peter. I'm ready to die for you. Jesus answered, are you really ready to die for me? I'm telling you the truth. Before the rooster crows, you will say three times that you do not know me. And, you know, you, I, it's, try to imagine yourself in Peter's shoes at that point in time. They've been arguing about who is the greatest in the kingdom right there. And God, and, and Jesus says, Peter, I love you to pieces, but you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows tomorrow morning. You say, not me, not, not me. Not me, not me. <laughs> incredible, absolutely incredible. Then we, 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 Jesus talks about the way to the Father. Chapter 14, he says, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare things for you. And then, for a long time I've been with you all. You, you Philip, very important verse actually. Look at um, verse 7. Now that you have known me, he said to them, you will know my father also, and from now on you do know him and you have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father, that is all we need. What was, what was Philip really saying? What, what, what was going on in his mind when he said that? I don't know if he had any doubt, but it seems like his faith was not as strong as it should have been. Faith in what? In, in what Jesus was saying. Okay. I wonder if Philip was inquiring about, if he, if he had an understanding of this father-son relationship that Jesus talked about all yeah. of the time. He uh -huh. thought that um, Jesus was completely different than the father. And please show me the father. Where, where would he get an idea about the father? From maybe their religion. Uh, yeah. Their religion had rules and regulations aplenty and Jesus didn't seem to have that. Mm -hmm. So, any other ideas? There's well, uh, Joe, uh, Jesus was kind of a lowly person. Uh -huh. That was not exactly what they, they thought for. God was, you okay. know, so they're looking for, come on, show us the Father. Don't hide him. He's right. referred to the Father many times in yeah. his conversations with his yeah. Father. Maybe but why, why would they think the Father was different? Well, maybe in their past, they remembered their relatives at the bottom of Mount Sinai or the opening of the temples, and there was uh -huh. smoke and thunder and lightning. Uh -huh. and, and Jesus, you're not showing us the Father because the Father, wherever the Father is, there's smoke, thunder, lightning, and this voice that scares mm. us to death. Why didn't they ask him, why did you drown all those people in the flood? Why did you kill the firstborn in Egypt? Why did you shake the mountain and scare everybody to death about Sinai? Why did you order the storming of Achan and all his family and his pets? They probably had no problem with those things. They, they knew the reasons for that. That's what God did. He, well, well, but he that's gets exactly, even and he punishes and he... That's here. precisely the point here. He's saying, we know what God is like, that God of the Old Testament, but you're so different. Yes. So kind and loving and helpful. And, and how could, you know, and you're, you're, trying, you're trying to us to say, okay, I'm like him. Huh? And he said that. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. And when you see and me. And what's the problem there? When you see me, you see the Father. And they were not seeing the Father in Jesus. Well, the problem, oh. problem is the Old Testament screwed everything up. <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem here is that they... And admittedly, their religion had probably, their, their religious leaders had probably made the thing worse than it could have been. But they could not figure out how to relate the God of the Old Testament as they perceived him and this Jesus that they had spent two, three years with. 
that happens today. I yeah. had a person tell All me the that they don't like the God of the Old Testament and they like the New Testament. In fact, one person just gave me half a Bible, the New Testament. What? Um, who was the God of the Old Testament? Jesus. Huh? Jesus. Where would you? Where would? Where would you get that idea? Well, from the very next verse, verse nine. Read it to me. Jesus answered to Philip's question in verse 8. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time. Philip was saying, Show us the Father. Yeah. And Jesus was like, Philip, don't you know me? Th that still implies that somehow or other you're supposed to look at Jesus and you're supposed to somehow equate him for this God of the Old Testament. I'm, I want to know, do we have positive proof who the God of the Old Testament was? First yes. Corinthians ten four. First Corinthians ten four. Maybe we should look at that one first. That's one of the most obvious ones. First Corinthians ten. I'm going to start reading from verse one because you need to get the full context. This is Paul speaking to the church at Corinth where he had spent a year and a half. I want you to remember, my friends, I'm reading from the Good News Bible. What happened to our ancestors who followed Moses? Now, pretty clear what time he's talking about, right? They were all under the protection of the cloud and all passed safely through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses. All ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. Who was the God who shook the top of Mount Sinai? Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus himself. Right. Well, look at Luke 24, 44, which is closer to our story for right now. Luke 24, 44. Then he said to them, Jesus is now speaking to the people in the upper room. After the resurrection now, he's appeared to them in the upper room. Luke 24, 44. Then he said to them, These are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms had to come true. The entire Old Testament, the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms, that's, to a Jewish person, that's the Tanakh, which refers to the entire Old, what we would call the Old Testament, they would call their Bible. The entire Old Testament talks about who? Jesus. Jesus. So really the Jews in the Old Testament were worshiping Jesus. They didn't understand him the way we understand Jesus, but yes, the answer is yes. That's and correct. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I have a question. Uh, the name of God, Yahweh, I've heard from some people that in Hebrew, Yahweh means grace, hand, and nail. Something like that. Uh, you, can use, you can use a lot of, of symbolism. To It's called the Tetragrammaton. There are four letters to it in the Hebrew because when you read it, you're supposed to sub, you know, you're supposed to include the the right vowels. You, so they just had the consonants, and um, you know, you can you can put those things together in different ways. Mm. It it to the Hebrews, the name Yahweh or Yahweh was a was the personal name for God, and to them, it was too sacred even to pronounce. So when they're reading, even today, if a Jewish person who, who's, who's conservative and knows what he's doing is reading along in Hebrew and he comes to the name, that four-letter four word, four-letter words were very different in those days than they are now. When he came to that four-letter word, he would not pronounce that. He would pronounce the name for Lord, which is Adonai. So he'd be reading along and then he would see the, the letter Yahweh and he would say Adonai and then he'd just continue reading. So that's, that was their standard custom. They still consider that name too sacred to pronounce. It's the personal name of God. There's an interesting statement here. If the disciples believe this vital connection between the Father and Son, their faith would not forsake them when they saw Christ's suffering and death to save the perishing world. Mm -hmm. How would that well, be? Give us a reference to that one. That's the Desire of Ages 664, paragraph 2. Okay. If they had understood that vital connection, mm -hmm. can, can you expand on that a little bit? Help us understand that? Well, what it's saying to us, and this is a fantastic challenge for Christians, and it's a challenge that most Christians haven't even considered, 
And that's it. If you want to know what Jesus is like, you have to start with Genesis and go all the way to Revelation because it's all talking about the same person. And even if you say it's Father and Son, they are like that. They are exactly the same. If you read That I May Know Him, another book by Ellen White, page 338, it says right there that if the Father had come instead of the Son, the story we have over the life of Jesus would not have been one tiny bit different. It would have been exactly the same. So, well, the Son was very pleasing to the Father also. Mm -hmm. The Son was... Jesus is the Father's words. Mm -hmm. The Son is implementing what the Father wants to say in action. Jesus is coming down to carry out the plans that the Godhead, all three of them, planning together, had decided step by step this is exactly what needed to happen. And Jesus came and followed the pattern exactly. Mm -hmm. But there's um, still the story about God in the Old Testament and the story about God in Jesus' life seems to be different. It seems to be different. It seems to be different. What do we do about so, that? So um, they have to be put together. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenge for us. That's really a huge challenge for us, but we have to do that. Although a couple of... In the Old Testament, God was constantly helping his people, helping his people. They were constantly turning from him, sinning, and he would constantly go after them. So it was Jesus-like. Mm -hmm. It was Jesus back there. If they had, if they had viewed Jesus as God, mm -hmm. and while he was being crucified, going through all of that, they were saying, this is God. This is God. This is... What is God doing here? Yeah. What 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 it is? And they might have gotten out of that mindset. A completely different picture. That that Jesus was going to set up a kingdom, yeah. because here's God performing this act, doing these things. What's He doing here with that? You're saying with that scenario, that whatever they got after the resurrection, if they could possibly have had that before the crucifixion. Yeah. It'd be completely different. Yeah, they would the, actually be able to, the, to see the, what was going on. And here's my question, and I say it reverently. Does that mean that Jesus was a failure as a teacher? Well, doesn't it take steps for a student to learn to get to the point where he graduates? Well, but I mean, here you are. I mean, think about what happened. For at least the last year and a half of Jesus' life, actually the last two years of Jesus' life, he, is, he was eating with them and sleeping with them and walking with them day after day after day and day and night. I mean, how long does it take you to teach? As long as it takes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That, have, that's very helpful. When we have children, you know, those children, they're, they're lovely as babies and they grow and they mm -hmm. get maybe a little uh, frisky or whatever. You know, four or five, six years old, they're full of energy. And then teenager years happen, you know. So I think Jesus was a wonderful teacher. It was we, the students, we, we just think, need maturity. Didn't I have the brightest, disciples need brightest, maturity. Brightest students in school. Well, you know, That's Jesus had situation. a bigger plan. Jesus was setting up a kingdom against sin, mm -hmm. not against the mere mortal little world and a... A, a palace and a kingdom down here on earth, but he was setting up a kingdom that would take care of sin. He was battling sin, mm -hmm. which would, disciples didn't realize how terrible sin was. He would have had to destroy their freedom in order to get them past this. They were that steeped in it. Mm -hmm. And well, he couldn't teach them because he couldn't violate their freedom. Yeah, but look, I mean, we've been at this for almost 6,000 years. We've had the problem and all the Old Testament, we have the New Testament, we have everything since the New Testament and and the message is is still the same and you know even we would say here at this table you know even there are many, there's a great deal of Christianity that hasn't even caught the picture. Well, yeah. They would have had to understand selflessness they would have had to understand God being selfless. And we need to understand the same thing. 
And I'm not at all sure that we do understand that. Mm -hmm. We just we spend most of our lives trying to take care of ourselves. Well, well but the time the time I get it figured out, Norm, I die. And there's a new <laughs> generation that comes along and they have to start all over. Well, and you know, and unfortunately it turns out that for most Christians, the plan of salvation is how do I get saved? It's mm -hmm. all about me. And that 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 is that is really something. Not how the universe gets cleansed; it's how I get saved. Yeah, and this is going through a teaching process. It's almost like we're saying that the sacrifice is actually being is actually Jesus being a teacher mm -hmm. to us. Exactly. I mean, it's like all the stuff he has to go through to get us to to find out what he's talking about, what God is all about. And um, mm -hmm. that in itself is a pretty good sacrifice right there. Yeah. It was you know, one, it was one, one and two. Yeah. You know, many in various ways yeah. God speaks. And it takes a long time to teach finite beings about the infinite. Well, wasn't there a time when we maybe killed people who thought the earth was not flat? Yeah. And look at the scientists who believe in creation. Mm -hmm sometimes can't even speak up because they'll lose their jobs. Yeah. We have such thick heads that we really can't look at the evidence. Someone had to go sailing around the world and then they said, oh, he didn't fall off the edge. Mm -hmm. or, the, or they could have read the Bible where it says the world is a sphere mm -hmm. and, not, and not been confused by those who were confused. I, we I believe that's in the book of Job. Good idea. Before we get to the end of our session, a couple of things I'd like to point out. One is that if you would like to, to have available for you some of these materials that we use in, in sort of in preparation for our discussion, they're available on our website, which is www.theox, that's T H E O X dot O R G, theox dot O R G. And you can see some of the same stuff that we're, we're following here in, in our discussion. Also, yeah. After that. Right. Even when the Gospels were written, mm -hmm. did the disciples understand why Jesus had to die? Why he did die and what was going on? Well, it, it that turns last out week? that none of, the, none of the Bible writers, none of the Gospel writers actually discussed it. The one who discusses it is Paul. He's the one who talks about that, this, was, that was written before the Gospels. It was written before the Gospels, as far as we know. But, the, gos but the Gospels, which talk about Jesus, don't really talk about why he died. Yeah. Right. yeah Jesus never said, uh, there's no quotes that we have from Jesus. Yeah. And here is he saying, you know, one of these days I'm going to die and you're all going to be paid up. And yeah. <laughs> what do you mean there. by the Gospels? Is that just four books? Matthew, yeah. Mark, Luke, and John. Oh, okay. Yeah. Can do you, uh, I was... You know, we discussed, began to discuss early about um, this business of a sacrifice and yeah. some other things. And I was getting close to the end of our session here, and I, I didn't want to get this in. I, I was reading in, uh, in a book that's a, a good favorite to many of us here, Desire of Ages, this past week. Uh, in uh, it's uh, uh, page 790. And I, I, I'm hoping this. I can see how someone might read this and, and might draw a conclusion that some kind of a sacrifice is necessary. It says, uh, and this is, the scene here is that Mary has gone to find Jesus at the tomb and she, she encounters him and she says, uh, he says, don't touch me, I have to, I have to go. And here's what uh, Ellen White says, she said, Jesus refused to receive the homage of his people until he had the assurance that his sacrifice was accepted by the Father. Mm -hmm. He ascended to the, to the heavenly courts and from God himself heard the assurance of his atonement for the sins of men had been ample. Mm -hmm. And through his blood all might gain eternal life. The Father ratified the covenant made with Christ that he would receive uh, uh, repentant and obedient men and so on and so forth. Yeah. You know, to me, when I read that, it kind of confuses it. It, it no. confuses slightly, you know, kind of an approach that we use here. And I don't know if you can clarify that in two minutes and fifty-five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me say a couple things about that. One, 
And the reason I bring it up, I'm not sure we've, we've really yeah. addressed yeah. it here. And we haven't got to that part of the story yet, so you, you jumped ahead of us a little bit. But I think that statement is absolutely true. And I also I, I remember that the goal of every group, every writer, speaker, whatever, is to, is to meet his audience where they are. Ellen White, in her absolutely masterful way, in my opinion, was speaking to, a, to the majority of Christians who, who look at this situation and say, you know, Jesus died for me. He sacrificed himself, he paid the price, etc. And that's what they wanted to hear. That's the way they understand things. And it's true that in, in, in the sense that if Jesus had not died, the questions would not be answered, as we would say. The, 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 the solutions would not have been given. The, the accusations against God would not have been answered. And the great controversy couldn't come to an end. So what we would like to do in this group is not to say, that that's wrong, we would just like to say there's more to the story. And the more to the story is, okay, what's God's role? What is Jesus' role? What's Jesus actually trying to tell us by all he does? And we want to ask that great, big, huge question, why? And that, of course, is not something we're going to finish up today. So it looks like next time we'll be talking about what happened in Gethsemane, hopefully what happened in Calvary, and exactly what Jesus was trying to prove by those experiences. It's very interesting that we'll get there, as I said, next time, but just want you to think about it. In the Garden of Gethsemane, it says an angel had to come and revive him. Ellen White is very specifically in, specific in several places. She said, Jesus fell dying to the ground. What would happen to the plan of salvation if Jesus had died right there? And in addition to that, I would like to ask this question. Why was he dying in the garden of someone? No one has beaten him. No one has whipped him. No one, no crown of thorns, no nothing. Why is he dying there in the garden of Gethsemane? What was killing him? And then he's revived. And what is he revived to do? He went out and he went through that, all that those trials and those horrific experiences and so forth that we know about. And finally, he gives up his life there on Calvary. So next time, we'll try to pick up the story from where we are here. And don't miss it. We'll be there.